Clustering falls in the category of unsupervised learning methods, uh, where we are set out to learn the structure of the data in terms of a discrete set of clusters. Now today we cover one of the most famous methods for clustering, namely k-means clustering. Now remember, we're talking about unsupervised learning, so we're considering data points uh, without targets, so just observation x, and that could be visualized as follows. Suppose we have these 2D measurements, uh, which results in this uh, green point clouds. And uh, now we're, what we're going to assume is, we're going to assume that there's a discrete latent variable, and this latent variable encodes for uh, the cluster or the, 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 the latent class, which we do not observe, but we sort of assume that there are that there is some latent variable that um, results in the fact that we are observing my data points in, in two clusters, uh, roughly. And now we're set out to recover this uh, latent variable. Now let's put it like this. All our observations, x, are drawn from this, uh, well, uh, probability distribution for x. So when I make an observation, sometimes it lies over here, sometimes it lies over here. Uh, but generally we tend to see these two clusters. So we're going to assume that there will be two clusters, uh, a discrete latent variable which can take on two values. And let's denote it as follows. So we have a latent variable z, which uh, either means it came from the blue class or it came from the red class. Then basically this means that my data point is either drawn from this uh, conditional x given um, well, I'm, I'm considering the red class, or we say my data point came from uh, my blue class. So I, then I have this conditional x given my blue class. Where points drawn from this blue class are most likely to occur around this uh, blue cluster center. That's sort of um, the latent variable approach that we consider here. Now in this k-means clustering approach, we're actually going to discard the idea of probability. So we're not going to talk about uh, these probabilities. Uh, we're just going to perform this clustering, and, but we can still talk about uh, clusters as being uh, latent variables, right? So this, yeah, so, so these latent clusters that uh, are responsible for particular sets of, of data points. So now, so now we're going to let go of this probabilistic interpretation and for now not talk about probability distribution, but we're going to make hard assignments. We're going to say that this point either belongs to this uh, blue latent class or it belongs to the red latent class but our original data set in itself doesn't have this uh, latent variable information right we're only observing these x's and that's why we call it this this green so we do not encode for classes at this point but once we have done our clustering then we can look for new data points and make a hard assignment for the latent variable uh, blue versus red. And we're going to do this via the k-means clustering algorithm, uh, which is based on the fact that each cluster has its own mean. So the cross over here is called, uh, well, let's say the mean for cluster one, and then this cross is going to be the mean for cluster two. And then whenever a new data point comes in, this x for example, we're going to check which mean is closest, and then we simply assign a point to that uh, class. All right, so that is what we're going to do. And then the k-means clustering algorithm works as follows. We can formulate it as a minimization problem. So we, what we're dealing with is all this, this data set of observations xn, and we're going to cluster them. So those are those uh, green points. And we're going to cluster them into two groups, for example, or let's say in k uh, clusters. Now we can do this by minimizing the following um, error function or loss function. Now this error will be a function of my cluster means and uh, the labels that I assign to each uh, data point. So each point is going to belong to one of the clusters that's encoded via these uh, latent variable assignments z and k, where each uh, z and k, so for each data point n, I consider k classes, and this value is either zero or one. And that leads to a sort of one-hot encoding of my um, latent variable uh, classes. Meaning that my latent variable uh, set and k looks like this. So my end uh, latent variable looks like uh, set n1, set n2, up to set n k. And this factor consists of zeros and ones 
where it is only one for uh, the class to which it is assigned to, right? So it's a one hat encoding of uh, the Kate class. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to assign each data point to one of the classes via this one hot encoding um, of my latent variable. And I'm going to do that in such a way that my total error is going to be minimized. So that means for a fixed uh, K, for a fixed cluster K, I'm going to pick a mean. And then for all points in this cluster, I'm going to sum over the square distance from this point to this mean, right? Because this thing is only one if, uh, well, if the Kate index is indeed one. So I'm only summing the errors uh, within one cluster. So going back to this uh, example, suppose I have a cluster mean mu is one, then I look for all points which are assigned to cluster one, and then I want this m um, mean value to be placed at such a place, such that the distance uh, of all points to this cluster mean is as, as small as possible. But this also works the other way around. Suppose I have fixed a certain mean, then I want to assign the points uh, to the closest mean, because by making this assignment to the closest mean, I'm also going to minimize uh, this, this loss function. So I have two things that I'm going to change, uh, the means and the assignments. And this leads to an iterative optimization scheme uh, called k-means clustering, which is as follows. So we are going to initialize uh, the cluster means mu k with some random initialization. So this was my green data set and then I'm going to consider two classes. Uh, so I randomly place these two cluster centers over here. So that's step one, this initialization. Then I'm going to iterate the following. First of all, I'm going to make an assignment of each point uh, to the closest uh, cluster mean. So that's essentially uh, stated here formally, right? For each xn, I'm going to select the cluster. So I'm going to take the minimal cluster or the cluster that minimizes the distance. And that will be the cluster to which I assign this point to. So that looks like this. So I have this cluster points initialized like this, and these blue points are all closest to this one, and the red points are closest to this one. So this is the assignment step, which we are going to label as uh, the E step. I will explain in a minute why we call it the E step. So this will be step, the E step, the assignment step. And then once we make this assignment, we're going to update the means. So that's denoted with the M step simply by taking the average over all my data points within a class. Remember that the set and case is, is only one for this data point when it corresponds to the Kate class. So I'm really summing only for a fixed K, I'm summing only for the points within that class and average over it. So uh, now I'm updating my cluster means. Okay, so this update step will be denoted with an M, the maximization step. And this leads to a new set of uh, cluster means, right? Um, so we have all these blue data points. We have slightly more blue points on this side than on this side. So my mean is somewhere over here. So that's what you see over here. And the same for the red, it's heavier on this side. So the mean over all my red points is going to be located over here. And now once I've done that, I again go to perform this E step or also the assignment step. And that gives me this new distribution of points. Now all points closest to blue to this cross will be marked as blue and all points closest to the other uh, cross will be marked as red. Okay, now we're going to iterate this. So once we updated our assignments, we're going to update again the cluster means. So that's the maximization step, the M step, and that gives me a new set of, of means uh, mu k. And again, we update our assignments by assigning each point to the closest uh, cluster mean. Then we again update our cluster means, then we again make this assignment and so on. And we keep doing this until convergence. So at some point, the cluster means will not change anymore. Uh, so you see that this solution is exactly the same as this solution. Uh, so we reached convergence and we're done with the clustering algorithm. Okay, so this is a very simple algorithm consisting of an E step and an M step. And uh, we call this this is a sort of instantiation of the expectation maximization algorithm. So we call this the expectation step. And we call this the maximization step. And for now it is a bit artificial to call it the expectation and maximization step. But later on we will consider a probabilistic version of uh, k-means clustering in which uh, this expectation has a particular mean and the maximization step also has a particular meaning. 
But for now, let's ju just use it as labels. So we have an E step in which we update the assignments of each point to the corresponding cluster. And we have an M step, uh, which is used to, to find the new uh, cluster means. And that describes this very simple algorithm where we have this assignment step, assignment step, uh, followed by an update or maximization step, update of the means. And we iterate this. And the nice thing about this algorithm is that with every step, so both with the expectation step, with the E step, or the assignment step, as well as with the M step, we reduce this error function that I defined before. And it keeps reducing until it reached convergence. I recall that our objective J is defined as J is the sum over all my data points, sum over all my clusters, Z and K times the distance of my end data point to uh, this particular cluster mean. So that was what my objective was uh, defined to be. And then we have this assignment step. And by definition of this assignment step, for, for each XM, we're going to select uh, the label set N such that this thing is minimized. So really by definition of this assignment, we're going to make a decrease in this uh, loss function. Okay, so that's essentially this assignment step. And once we've made this assignment, we're going to update the cluster means. And then again, this results in a decrease in this loss function because we're going to uh, choose uh, the means mu k such that this error is minimized within that cluster. And I'm going to show this in the, the next slides actually that this uh, maximization step or this M set really reduces uh, this uh, cost function j. But essentially what is happening here that after this M step, the majority of points within this cluster will get closer to the cluster mean. Okay, so we iteratively keep increasing this uh, loss function until it converged. So we're actually able to show that the k-means clustering algorithm will converge, but it actually is going to converge to a local minimum because as a function of both mu k and z and k, so these cluster means and the cluster labels together, uh, this loss function is uh, highly um, non-convex. And this uh, property of convergence to a local minimum is actually obtained by fixing a particular mu and then updating z and k and then and then fixing z and k and then update the mu k. So this m step. So once this is fixed, this will become a quadratic loss as a function of mu k and hence a convex uh, optimization problem. So each of these individual steps solve some uh, convex optimization problem. But when we treat this, this loss as mu k and z and k together, uh, we're dealing with a non-convex uh, problem, which means that depending on my initialization, depending on where I place these points, I may end up with different um, partitionings uh, in the end. Okay, so this tells us that this k-means clustering will find a local minimum, but it is not guaranteed to find the global uh, minimum uh, assignment of, of points and uh, cluster means. And so the best thing that we can do is really work with random restarts. So uh, we start with different initializations and then we let the algorithm converge. We do this multiple times and in the end just select uh, the clusters which really minimizes a J over all these uh, random restarts that I did. So that's the best thing we can do. Just run this multiple times and in the end uh, select a solution that really has the lowest uh, value for J. Now what I'd like to show next is that this M step actually really minimizes this J so we can derive this uh, step by fixing uh, my uh, class labels or my uh, assignments and then finding the mu k that really minimizes this convex optimization problem. And the approach that we've been taking so far uh, a lot of times is taking the derivative of this loss with respect to mu k, this is the parameter that we're going to update and set it to zero. So what would the derivative of this uh, quadratic uh, function be in terms of uh, mu k? Now, first of all, we know that this L is uh, a class index, right? So this mu L. Uh, so this derivative only does uh, something whenever L is the same as K, meaning that this derivative is only non-zero only when L is K. And hence uh, this sum disappears and we can just fill in the K over here because that's the only case where uh, the derivative does actually do something. And then of course we can pull this derivative inside the sum, right? Because this sum in itself doesn't depend on K. 
Okay, that's uh, step one. And then the derivative of this quadratic form, we also computed that before. So what we're actually doing here is computing the, the mu k of xn minus mu k transpose xn minus mu k. And this will be equal to minus two, minus two times xn minus mu k transpose. Okay, so uh, this is derivative and we, we set it to zero and now we're going to solve it with respect to the cluster means mu k. So that's what we're doing in this uh, bottom part. So we take the transpose on both sides. Uh, so actually we just get rid of this transpose essentially. We're going to split this sum and then we move this part, which depends on mu k, uh, to the other side. So solving this tells me that the most optimal uh, Cluster mean values are obtained simply by taking the average over my uh, cluster points of my of my data points within this cluster. Because recall that the Z and case only take on the value one whenever my data uh, my end data points uh, belongs to the K class. So really, I'm summing over my my data points within this this class, and then I normalize by the number of points within this class. So re really, this is taking the average over my uh, points in this cluster. So that explains that with this. Uh, M step, we're really minimizing our objective function here. So in that sense, maybe this M step can be interpreted as a minimization step, uh, but we call it a maximization step because when we move to the probabilistic setting, um, this M step actually solves uh, the maximum likelihood uh, of my probability uh, distribution. But that's something that we discuss in the upcoming video. For now, it's clear to know that the k-means clustering uh, algorithm minimizes uh, this objective J step by step uh, via in, both in the expectation step as well as in uh, the, the M step, in this case a minimization step. Okay, now let's go over some applications of k-means clustering. In this first example we're going to use it for image compression and this is an example from the book of Bishop and maybe it is a somewhat old-fashioned or naive way for image compression but it will get us started on well what kind of applications can be solved with uh, k-means clustering. Now the idea is here to represent this image with as little data as possible. And we're considering the following problem. So we have uh, data points, which will be our clusters. So the xn's, each xn is one pixel, and this one pixel has an r, g, and a b value. So those are my uh, pixel values. Now, instead of storing all these pixel values of all these RGB values, I'm only going to store uh, the cluster to which each point belongs to. So this point belongs to the blue class and this one to the yellow class. And then with this information, I can reconstruct such an image. But if I consider, let's say three different colors, uh, then this would be a representation that I can store uh, cheaply. And if I use 10 colors, Basically I'm saying I want to represent this image with only 10 colors and I'm going to store for each pixel uh, which class color this uh, belongs to. Right, so we're going to cluster all these uh, color pixels into K clusters, K clusters, where each cluster represents, um, is a color representation. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're just throwing all these color pixels into one big pile and then we're going to, and then we recognize that there are a lot of colors that are similar. So we're just going to group, we're going to cluster all these colors that are similar together. We call them uh, yellow, for example, and all these points are similar. We call them blue. And this allows us to compress the data because now I only have to store, let's say, I have all these pixel values. I only have to store, uh, let's say this pixel belongs to class one, this to two, this to class one, uh, etc. So I only have to store these uh, integer values at all these pixel lo locations. So suppose my pixel, my image contains X by Y pixels. Then now I only have to store X times Y um, integers, which represents uh, the classes. So these are uh, either uh, one or two, for example, in this two class case. Whereas in the original image, I would have to store all these RGB values. So RGB for one pixel, RGB for the other pixel, um, yeah, etc. So that would mean I would have to store X times Y 
times three of such values, but also now my values, uh, so this number of values uh, in the range zero to 255. So I have much more data to store. Okay, again, so this is maybe a bit naive way for image compression. There are way better methods uh, than this, um, but the idea is there, right? So we can use clustering also for compression and maybe also now in this image uh, segmentation or an analysis task also for segmentation because now pixels that are of similar color, they are clustered together. So we have sort of the segmentation of, let's say, blue and, and yellow. Of course, a bit a silly method for segmentation because it doesn't take any spatial relations into account, right? Just similarities between colors. Okay, uh, enough for uh, about image compression. Um, there are also, also some limitations of k-means uh, clustering. And one of the main limitation is that k-means clustering only generates spherical clusters. So let's write it down, only generates spherical clusters. And this has to do with the fact that my clustering is based on distances of points to my cluster centers uh, based on the Euclidean distance. And then, well, uh, all points with equal distance to my cluster that forms a sphere, right? So with these kind of complex half moon data sets, uh, you will never make uh, a proper uh, clustering with k-means clustering. Another uh, limitation of k-means clustering is that each cluster has the same size. So let me write it down, each cluster... Each cluster is of equal size. And that's in this mouse data set. So this is sort of a, a Mickey Mouse kind of figure. So we have a face and, and two ears over here. Um, ideally, we want to cluster these ears uh, separately. And if you work with three classes, um, again, because we use this same Euclidean distance for each class, we end up with clusters of, of about equal size. And of course, we can increase the number of, of clusters. This sort of solves the problem because now um, each cluster is of about equal size and then these ears can be separated and then I would just need still need a way to, to cluster the face using these three uh, separate clusters. But that could be considered a limitation of k-means clustering, right? That each cluster is assumed to be of equal size and whereas in practice most data sets this will not be the case and we will come up with a solution to this in, in our probabilistic uh, framework actually. Now we can come up with some interesting points of improvements for uh, k-means clustering. Uh, first of all, uh, recall that this uh, error function that we minimize, so this j, is actually a sum over all my data points and the sum over all my clusters of z and k and then the Euclidean distance of xn to my cluster mean, my k cluster mean. And so this is a an error function which decomposes into a sum of individual errors that I make. So this also again makes it a candidate for stochastic uh, gradient descent for minimizing this particular thing. So that's nice. So also for this k-means clustering we can apply stochastic gradient descent to minimize j for example to update our cluster means. So that gives me the following update rule. And in that way I can come up with a very efficient algorithm that only considered uh, one data point at a time. Now one issue that I pointed out in the previous slide is that this k-means clustering is based on uh, the Euclidean distance of, of a point to the cluster mean. And so what we could also do is consider other type of distances between points and this actually results to uh, what is known to be the k medoids algorithm. So it follows the same structure as the k-means cluster uh, but now uh, my distance, my Euclidean distance can be replaced by any other um, this similarity measure or distance between uh, my, my, my points xn and, and clusters mu k. And in this way we can also introduce distances that are less sensitive to outliers. Uh, maybe you recall from previous videos that uh, this least squares minimization problem is highly sensitive to outliers, especially in the, the classification case where I'm dealing with uh, discrete data. Maybe also when my data isn't uh, nicely Euclidean, I can introduce different type of, uh, of distance metrics essentially. Okay, so in summary, the k-means clustering algorithm, it is a very famous algorithm and it's widely used uh, primarily because it is so simple to implement and it is a very fast algorithm. But it also suffers from some uh, problems, right? Uh, first of all, we saw that it uh, only converges to local minima, uh, so it does not provide a global optimal partitioning of my data. Um, 
we saw that the clusters that arise from uh, k-means clustering they are uh, sort of spherical right because of this euclidean distance and also the k-means clustering algorithm is sensitive to the scales of features and with that i mean the following suppose my data looks like this so i have let's say a two-dimensional data set of points which are maybe stretched in one direction so this distribution and we have another set of points stretched in the uh, along also the same direction then ideally you would want to cluster this uh, into these elongated clusters right uh, but what's happening with k-means clustering is again that we assume a Euclidean distance so we draw these circular clusters uh, at these points still they would be able to find this um, division between the data sets uh, but you can imagine that maybe uh, this algorithm is sensitive to changes along uh, this direction compared to uh, this direction. Now ideally you want your uh, clustering algorithm to take this anisotropic distance into account or alternatively we can uh, pre-process our data to make it isotropic and that's something that we will learn in uh, the lecture 10 uh, when we talk about principal component analysis we will introduce a widening operator which turns this data set into uh, well isotropic point clouds so we can turn this into isotropic features uh, via widening operator and that makes it actually more the data more suitable to work with uh, k-means clustering um, another limitation of k-means clustering is um, that we have to choose the number of clusters in advance uh, so this requires some pre-knowledge from us so like okay i'm going to assume that there's k latent clusters in my data sets maybe because someone told me so or maybe i inspected the data and i roughly saw two point clouds okay but then there's also a lot of heuristics for automatically determine uh, the right amount of clusters k which we're not going to cover in in, in this course actually um, and then finally and this is what we're going to solve in the upcoming videos is that now the cluster assignments are hard and if you have overlap between the distributions then maybe you're not fully sure whether a point belongs either to the red class or to the blue class and we can deal with this uh, via a probabilistic uh, modeling approach and that's what we're going to discuss next using gaussian mixture models